Today we're going to talk about what the top 50 apps do with IAP that the rest of us don't do. We're going to talk about, get it, no wait, wrong list, sorry. We're going to talk about how the top 50 did, what their results were, and then we're going to talk about what they did differently than we did to get those results. And we'll talk about that as in terms of selling and in terms of engagement. Now, a lot of people ask, why does Amazon care about this? Well, Amazon has an app store. We have an app store in 236 countries and territories worldwide. Our app store works on all Android devices, including our own line of uh, Kindle Fire tablets, Fire TV, Fire TV Stick. The Amazon app store is now the default app store on BlackBerry 10 devices. Um, so we actually have a lot of developers and 500,000 apps in our store. And if we can help each developer be a little bit more successful, that means a whole lot more happier customers, that's a big deal, and happier customers help you earn more money, that's also a big deal. So, because this is a big deal to Amazon, we did what Amazon does really well. We measured stuff. And that's how we decided to measure what the top 50 apps are doing that the rest of us don't. I mean, you guys have been there, you guys know this, right? You guys have been playing a game Personally, I'm a huge tower defense fan. If you're building a tower defense game, come talk to me. I love them. So if you're playing a tower defense game that's really good and you like it, you can go and, well, because I work at Amazon, I can go and I can take a look at how it's doing in the store compared to other apps. And you know what? I find out that one of my favorite games isn't even in the top 50, and it's behind other games that I don't think are quite as good. So what on earth is that top 50 game doing differently than the game I think is a lot better? Well, uh, to find out, we started measuring things. So we measured uh, using a cohort study. Now, a cohort analysis is just a fancy way of saying that we took the top 50 apps and we looked at 100 downloads of each app, so 5,000 users, and we normalized that so they all would, we would measure them starting all on you know, day zero, the day they installed. And we took a look at 50 apps, 100 downloads, of each of the 50 apps that were equivalent, but not quite in the top 50. So we have another 5,000 users uh, that represent the rest of us. Okay, I say top 50 and I say the rest of us because personally my apps are not in the top 50. If your apps are in the top 50, um, please bear with me on this one and feel free to chime in if you like. So what happens on day one? Well, on day one, we have our representative 100 people who have installed the top 50 apps and our representative 100 people who have installed the apps from the rest of us. What happens after you install the app? Well, you either use the app or you don't use the app. That's odd. Why would people download an app and not use it? Well, there are a bunch of reasons. Some of them include paywalls or offer walls. Hey, I, I'm playing this other game over here, and I really want to get some in-game soft currency. And if I watch this ad or if I install this other app, I'll get the currency. So you install the other app, and then you never intend on using it. So you just go ahead and uninstall it later. Um, some of these are just late day one uninstallations. You tried it uh, or you didn't try it. You just decided you weren't going to anyway. So obviously, if about 40% of your downloads never even get played, you're going to see a lot of them get deleted. Not a problem. So more interesting than the number of active users and the number of deleted uh, app installs are what are people buying? How many people are paying? So we took a look at this, and about depending on how you want to measure it, either 3% of all downloads uh, turn into paying users, or 6% of actual used in, in, and uh, active apps turn into paying users. So at this point, you'll notice that the retention data for the top 50 apps isn't really that much different than the retention data from the apps by the rest of us. This is great news. This is a fantastic place to start. We're not starting behind anyone. We're actually starting, you know, by some metrics, just a little bit better than the top 50 apps are. But beyond retention data, I'm going to call this top block retention data, we want to take a look at what people are doing in the app. So we took a look at a couple of things. The first is, how did people spend their time in the app? So these pie charts down below represent 
um, session minutes in the far left hand side so that you see the top 50 have about 7.4 minutes per session the rest of us have about 6.9 minutes per session the second chart um, is number of sessions for active user so basically how many different sessions do they have during the day the top 50 get about three not quite so much for the rest of us and then the last one well if you do the math and you multiply the average session length by the number of sessions you get total session minutes for your particular app per user for the day that's actually not an insignificant advantage for the top 50 keep an eye on that while the numbers will change a little bit, the percentage that the top 50 get is definitely going to change. And this turns out to be a pretty big factor in monetization. So now we're getting a good idea of how much time the users spend in the app. But what do they do when they get there, specifically around spending? Well, as it turns out, we're going to go ahead and measure that. So we took you know, a lot of apps, and a lot of them have really different price points. So we can't give you an absolute dollar amount, but what we can do is give you relative dollar amounts. So we normalized the spend based on what the rest of us are doing, and we nailed that at 100%. That way we can see the relative difference between what the rest of us are doing and what the top 50 are doing. In this case, in terms of the number of items that are being purchased by a, by a paying user, the top 50 are selling about 12% more stuff than the rest of us. The big deal here is they're selling it for a lot more money. They're selling it for, what, 36% uh, more than we're selling our stuff for. All right, how many of you have already done the math? That's right, if you multiply the number of items purchased times the selling price, you see that they have a 54% advantage an average revenue per paying user on day one. That's huge. Big, big difference there. So day one is big. Let's take a look at day two. What changes on day two? On day two, our retention data doesn't really change that much. Um, we see a little bit of improvement in session minutes and session count again for the top 50 as they increase the, the attractiveness of continuing to play. But take a look at the price advantage. The price differential has dropped considerably on day two. It's not because the top 50 did something wrong. Actually, it's because we did something better. We started selling deeper into our catalog, and we started selling some of our higher priced items. And that brought down the margin between the, uh, the top 50 and the rest of us. So that when you do the math, it turns out that the top 50 are only getting 14% more average revenue per paying user on day, on, you know, a day later on day two. How about three days later? The retention data still pretty even between the top 50 and the rest of us. Yeah, the top 50 are really starting to win the battle on number of active minutes. So we're going to have to keep an eye on what's going on there. And, well, just like we dug deeper into our catalog to sell some of our more expensive items, well, the top 50, they've got even deeper catalogs, and they reach even deeper in, and now they're getting back to a larger margin in the price of items sold. So they're back to a 31% advantage in average um, uh, uh, revenue per paying user. A week later, we start to see some differences in actual retention data. There's about a 25% difference now in retained users. And again, the number of minutes per session just keeps favoring the top 50. And they continue to build a trend of selling more items. It never really gets more than 102 to 110. But again, they just are able to sell a few more items for a relatively larger amount of money between 10 and 25 percent more so they see a lot more average revenue two weeks later there's a 40 percent difference in retention 40 percent multiplied by you know an additional 20 percent average revenue per paying user adds up how about a month later a month later okay this is huge a 100 percent user retention difference how many people here went and saw half bricks presentation on increasing seven-day retention. Um, only a couple of you guys. They actually had some really good ideas about increasing seven-day retention. And um, seven-day retention actually ends up being kind of a, a pivotal point for a lot of game developers. Um, certainly a month later, we see big advantages in time. We see a, an ARPU advantage that just keeps on going. But a lot of developers ask me, why do I even worry about two weeks or a month later, 
when all of the data we have, again, AppFlyer talked about the same thing, AppTentive talked about the same thing here this week, by seven days, you've lost 80% of your day one users. Why would you care what happens at week two or, or week four? Well, you'd care if you took a look at this graph and looked at in-app purchases per hour. So obviously, the first day, the first 24 hours is huge. The first 24 hours for apps that we did, we looked at in our study, got 18% of their revenue in that first 24 hour window. Okay, but let's do the math on that. That means there's 82% of the revenue that's left over that's farther down this chain. Now, seven days, uh, if you, I, I should have put days instead of hours there, I'm sorry. 168 hours is seven days. And that's where a lot of people start not to care anymore. They stop caring at 168 hours. Now, if I'd had um, you know, four or five screens I could have used to project, this tail out at 288 hours keeps going and going. It actually goes all the way into the next conference room over there, and it doesn't stop. That's a huge amount that your, uh, you know, the 20% you got left at day seven, the 10% you have left at day 30 keeps going. And that's super important for how much you monetize your app because the longer people are in your app, the more money they will spend per item. A user that's been in your app for 30 days will spend 60% more on an in-app purchase item than they spent when they were in your app on day one. That makes that long tail really, really profitable. And that's what we're going to spend some time looking at as how we can maximize um, uh, those areas for revenue. <clears throat> so now that we've looked at a bunch of the data, what did we learn from the data? Well, <laughs> We learned that the top 50 sell more items for a higher price. <laughs> I know, you don't need me to come up here and tell you that, you know, if you sold more items for a higher price, you guys would be in the top 52. Um, don't worry, we'll take a look at um, what they did to get those results. But one of the things that they all were aware of is that the retention numbers, while important, aren't the only numbers that they need to be paying attention to. That session length, and session count are also key data points to helping them monetize their apps. So let's take a look at what they did differently, what they did differently in regards to selling. The first thing the top 50 guys know are these numbers. They understand that 64% of their revenue is going to come from someone's third or later order. If they see someone who's made a couple purchases, they're treating that user like gold. In your game, do you have the mechanics to know how many orders a specific user has made? Can you treat them differently if they've made three or more orders? Uh, trust me, the top 50 are. They know that almost three quarters of their revenue is going to come after that first seven days. Think about that. We stop worrying about retention at seven days, yet three quarters of the revenue that our app is going to generate is going to come after seven days we'd better be caring about that 30-day user more than we care about just about anybody else in our game. Because you know what? Half of the revenue we're going to make is going to be because of that guy who's been in our app 30 days. I mean, they, we have no bigger fans for our app than people who've been playing it for 30 days. These are our, they think we're brilliant. They've been in our app for 30 days. They love us. Are we treating them like gold? Are we showing them stuff that's different than we showed them on day one? Or are we showing them the same old stuff? One of the things the top 50 know is that 48% of repeat orders are going to happen within one hour of a prior purchase. Now, I know I just showed you guys a whole bunch of data that said session minutes are about seven minutes long. And a lot of you are thinking, okay, Mike, where is this hour coming from? Well, I tell you what, it's not coming from the same session. It's coming from a subsequent session. If your app is not super easy to open, launch, and get going, they might have fewer sessions. Having fewer sessions is going to impact being able to get your app open within an hour for a repeat purchase. 
So the top 50 all do a really good job of making sure that their apps are easy to open and get into so they can capture that subsequent purchase. One of the other data points that we looked for in our survey was the number of people who purchased on day one in relation to their future purchases. Now, as it turns out, 30% of the people who are ever going to purchase, purchase something on day one. How many thought this number would be bigger? I mean, I sure did. I thought that 80% of the people who were ever going to purchase might have purchased on day one. But it turns out that's almost the other way around. That most of the people who you will get money from, most of the people who will become loyal customers of yours, aren't going to buy something on day one. So all of the people who are players, not payers in your system, need to be given special attention. Maybe they just haven't seen the right offer yet. So don't give up on them um, because there is still a, a lot of revenue to be, to be you know, received later. And the top 50 understand that they can only make the purchases if you show them how to do it. In our survey, what we discovered was that apps that showed users how to buy in-app purchase items in the tutorial sold two and a half times more in-app purchase items than games that didn't. And they're not really being in your face about it either. I mean, they're not being abusive. You have to buy this, buy this, buy this, buy this. It's just kind of a casual mention. By the way, you know, you can use your soft currency to go ahead and get more dog food. You can use hard currency to buy new collars or, or a you know, new dog house or something. So it's just sort of a, a mention in passing, but you know it's available and you know exactly what to click on in order to do it. So if you have taught your user how to acquire in-app purchase items, well, of course you want to teach them how to use in-app purchase items. And that turns out to be really important. If a user can't figure out how to apply a power-up in a specific situation in your app, what's the chance that they're actually going to buy more of them? They can't consume them, they can't use them up, and they can't buy more. So if you show them how to consume the in-app purchase item that they've just bought, they will buy 65% more items. Again, they'll have a 65% higher reorder rate than apps that don't show you how to consume in-app purchase items. All right, what have we got? We've got, I show you how to buy it. I show you how to use it. We need something to sell, don't we? Okay, so when it comes to offering things to sell, bigger catalogs are unequivocally better than small catalogs. Now, uh, we normalized, again, on six to 10 items. Apps that have a smaller catalog between one to five only sell 69% as much as apps that have um, uh, you know, six to 10. And if you have 11 to 15 items, you're actually making 45% more average revenue per paying user. Now, th the people who have 11 to 15 items are not putting all 15 in the store at once. That turns into a terrible user experience. And you know, you guys have seen those really bad in-app purchase stores. All the items are crowded in, you can't see them, or they scroll down, they're terrible. Um, none of the top 50 do that, and really only one of the apps and the rest of us actually had a horrible dialogue. But it's important to know that even though the top 50 are still showing only six or eight items in the store, what they show is different depending on the user. They're going to show a day one user a different eight items from their catalog than they're going to show a day 30 user. You can bet that they're showing the day 30 user stuff that's about 60% more expensive. And that's why they have a deeper catalog, so they have more variety they can show to the right user at the right time. Are you guys showing your day 30 user the same in-app purchase items you showed them on day one? Why would he ever go back if he knows it never changes? if he's already seen everything you have to offer. Think about having more variety in terms of offers. Now, having more things to sell is great. Variety here is fantastic. Variety in price points, however, is tragic. Um, people that have too many price points don't sell very much at all. Um, quick caveat here. In our survey, we excluded casino apps. We did not count gambling apps uh, when we did our study. This is really important. Gambling apps have a hundred price points. One price point for each dollar that you might want to buy. Um, they throw everything off in the curve. 
So uh, we don't include gambling apps for, for what we're looking at here. But for non-gambling apps, um, why do you think one through five price points make a big difference? It's a rhetorical question, really. And it's not because like, there's a bad price. $2.99 is not somehow evil, and you can't ever charge $2.99. But think about it. If you've got a store, and you've got something for $0.99, cents, $1.99, $2.99, $3.99, $4.99, $4 is going to look at that and think, holy cow, why would I get something for $3.99 instead of $2.99? Or for that matter, if I'm going to do $2.99, why not $1.99? What's the difference? You're confusing the user. Now, we all know a confused user isn't going to buy the most expensive item in your catalog. Actually, a confused user won't buy the least expensive thing in your catalog either. Truth is, a confused user won't buy anything in your catalog. So you need to be crystal clear about the value difference between your price points in your catalog. Too many price points makes it really, really difficult to communicate clearly the value between them. Most of this could be laid out in the kind of store that you have and how good a job you do at communicating that value. And like I said, when we looked at the 50 apps that represented the rest of us, we only had one app that had a really bad in-app purchase dialogue. The rest of them had pretty good in-app purchase dialogues, kind of like this one. This isn't bad. This is actually really nice. It's not crowded. There are only six things. It's easy to see what they are. It's easy to see what the price is. Um, that middle one on the right-hand side, I'm really kind of not quite sure what that is. It's either soft currency items and hard currency items put together or I don't know if that's the only way I can get some of those things if I buy a package. So I'm not, it's a little bit of apples and oranges there. It's a little bit different. I'm not sure about that. But I've got a lot of soft currency I can purchase and I can spend anywhere between $1 and $60 to buy it. But why would I spend $60? Okay, I know some of the engineers in the room have already done the math in their heads. But why are you trying to get your users to do math? Make it really simple and really clear for your users to understand what the difference is. I love this in-app purchase dialogue here. This in-app purchase dialogue actually has the benefit to the customer as big as the price. They know exactly what they get if they spend $50 on soft currency. They get 100% more stuff than they would if they spent 99 cents. They don't have to think about it twice. As a matter of fact, they're not going to shop as much by price point as they shop by the bonus or benefit they get. This is huge. You're not making them do math in their heads when you're trying to get them to buy something. Also notice that you've just got soft currency for sale up here. You're not mixing soft currency and hard currency. It's hard to confuse people when you don't mix and match them. Now, you may be a fan of tabs as a UI element. Maybe you don't like tabs at all. But have, they have a way of, of going back and forth between a hard currency store and a soft currency store. And that really makes it crystal clear because you're no longer mixing and matching and you're making the decision super simple for the customer. And that makes them a lot more likely to buy. Wonderful. So what did we learn um, about kind of how they sell? Games with larger selection absolutely receive more orders if you're offering the right item to the right user at the right time. If you actually teach people how to buy in-app purchases, they'll buy more stuff. And if you teach them how to use it, they'll consume it and they'll reorder more. No big secret there. And making sure that your in-app store is crystal clear is super valuable. Now, let's take a look at what they did differently in terms of engagement to get more session minutes and to get more uh, sessions per day. First of all, everything you learned from Half Brick, solid information. Absolutely take out your notes and reread those notes. I won't cover uh, much of that territory again. But um, step one is reducing barriers to frequent use. Uh, I had a Connect Four game that I really like to play. The only problem was I would start the app, I would get this beautiful splash screen, I'd have to press continue. Then it would give me a menu and I would have to press start new game. And then I'd have to pick my options, what size board, what color do I want to be, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. It took me, ah, uh, it took me um, a fair amount of time actually to figure out, uh, you know, to, to get into the game. And that was a barrier to frequent sessions. 
Also, if you can't pick up where you left off, that's a barrier to frequent sessions. If you're playing a tower defense game on my tablet, I get to uh, level 14. If I go to the store on my phone and pick it up and I have to start at level one, am I gonna play? Heck no, I'm not gonna go through those first 14 levels again. I'm gonna, I wanna pick up at level 14. Um, most, most places that have um, game services packages uh, will actually give you this for free. This is um, Amazon Game Circle, but most of the game service packages will offer something that synchronizes progress across devices uh, available for you to do for free. Tuning game difficulty is also super important. I mean, this is not gonna be fun if you're the big guy. Okay, well, maybe once. But for the small guy, not at all. And this is, what, um, this is why Half Brick started tuning game difficulty the very first time they saw they had a retention problem. Now, if it turns out you don't have a game difficulty balance problem, fixing something that's not broken won't help. Um, Half Brick discovered that too. But if you do have a game difficulty balance problem, Fixing that is critically important. They learn to use A-B testing on everything. A-B testing is absolutely important here. And don't optimize game difficulty for in-app purchase acquisition. That only creates a pay-to-win kind of game. You want to optimize for minutes in session. Optimize your game difficulty for minutes in session. Add social. Social is critical. Um, Leaderboards and achievements is kind of like the base entry. Sharing the stuff on Facebook is kind of just the, the cost of admission here. The APIs are free, they're super simple. All of the different game services have a free, uh, free service for leaderboards and achievements. Again, that's Amazon's, well, because I work for Amazon. But Google Play has a game service that does leaderboards and achievements, so does Apple. They're easy to implement, you have no excuse not to. Also, I want you to make in-app purchases insanely easy to use in the game. How many people know Tower, Defense, Tower Balloon's Defense from Ninja Kiwi? Oh, guys, okay, first of all, you've all got to download this game and play it. It's an amazingly brilliant game. But if I wanted to get a tower to help pop the balloons that are coming through, and I clicked on a lock, could I buy it? No, actually. I had to quit the game, go back out to a menu, buy it, start the game all over again. That's hideous, they had terrible results. Well, Ninja Kiwi, they're smart, they learned. On their next tower defense game, they made sure that the soft currency items are over in a column on the left, the hard currency items are on the right. So when I've got a horde of zombies streaming towards my civilian population, and I don't have enough towers to stop them, I can click on the nuclear hand grenade. Just what I needed, it shows me how to use it, brilliant. I drag the nuclear hand grenade over the top of the horde of zombies. Boom! An amazing graphic effect later. Zombie parts flying everywhere. My civilian population is safe. And I've just bought something from them because they made it available where I needed it, when I needed it, and they showed me how to use it. Ninja Kiwi is much happier with the performance of in-app purchasing in this app than in their previous app. All right. Have a lot of levers. Make sure you can change things in the runtime of your game. This is all about A-B testing, guys. We learned this from Half Brick. We learned this from Zepto Labs. We learned this from uh, most of the major game developers. Do A-B testing so they can modify um, not just difficulty, but other things in their game to maximize repeat sessions and maximize time per session. Um, Amazon Game Services has free A-B testing services. There are, are other free A-B testing services that are out there. They're easy to implement. You don't need to write your own. I can, there are like at least four providers of free A-B testing services that you can use, and the APIs are pretty simple. Honestly, it'll take you 12 lines of code to start changing the dialogue in dialog boxes or on buttons. Um, there's no reason you shouldn't do that. All right, so what did we learn? Absolutely make sure you can tweak game difficulty to make sure you increase the session time and session count, not necessarily in-app purchase sales. You don't want to make a play to win or a pay to win game. Second, differentiate your IAP catalog. If you're offering people on day 30 the same stuff you showed them on day one, they're not going to buy much. And give yourself control of your game after it's been launched with A-B testing. Now, if you only do one thing as a result of listening to my talk here today, I want you to differentiate your IAP catalog. If you do two things, differentiate your IAP catalog and make your catalog super clear about user value. Guys, 
I really appreciate your being here. If you want a copy of the slide deck, we can't give you the slide deck, but we can point you to a series of articles I wrote that has all the same data in it, uh, Bitly Top 50 IAP. If you like the kind of data I was able to share with you today, please go to Bitly Amazon's uh, CC Asia and let us know if it's valuable or not. It actually takes a lot of time and a lot of money to do these kinds of studies, and if you don't like it, well, stop doing it. So absolutely let us know whether you want to see more of this stuff. Guys, thank you very much for your time. Follow me on Twitter. I'd be happy to answer any questions you have. I'm going to go straight over to the meeting rooms to our left so the next speaker can get started. Thanks, guys. Big round of applause.